is in his sleeping area of the orphanage. With him are some six children who need nursing during the night. He is working on his diary. It's a hot August. Children are sleeping, 200 of them. I spend at least 10 minutes listening to children breathing, coughing, sighing. There's so much to learn from the cough of a sleeping child. What's the matter, Rivka? Huh? Can't you sleep? Hey, come on, give me your hand. Uh, let's have a look at these little fingers. Oh, look, the little finger is going to sleep. Uh, and here, the next finger is going to sleep too. And now the middle finger, right? And look, this one too, that's the fourth finger. It's going to sleep. And you too, you big fat thumb. You go to sleep too. Okay? All right? Ah, got kidva, share bure obedra. The other day, there was another fight with the Jewish Relief Committee. I'm not asking for anything. I'm telling you. I must have three sacks of flour, one sack of cereal, and yeast. That's what I said, yeast. For the children, that's for whom? I can't sleep at night when it's quiet. The clock is going around faster and faster and faster. And I have so much to do to put everything in some kind of order. Will I have enough time? On July 22nd, my birthday, the Germans presented the Jewish Council with the final relocation plan of the Jews to the East. It's not possible, they say, for them to want to murder an entire people. We must meet their relocation quotas. That way, perhaps, the rest of us will survive. Well, some of us. How do they expect me to part from my children? Somebody else came from the other side of the wall and then tried to persuade me to leave. Apparently they even have a room ready for me. I told them, as I told all the others, I am not a deserter. No one can possibly keep me away from my children. I feel good after that, Butka. Peaceful, safe. Life is great. A few days ago, I bought myself 50 grams of so-called sausage. It cost me one zloty 20, cheaper than bread. I asked the shop assistant, my dear young lady, are you quite sure this isn't human meat? Seems to be rather cheap for horse meat. And she said, I really can't tell. I wasn't there when they were making it. She didn't smile as she would to a, a witty old customer. <coughs> she merely stopped cutting and stood waiting for my decision. It was a poor joke. I always gave my nationality as Polish and my religion as Jewish, with a question mark. Because I don't know what faith I am, <coughs> even though my faith was always held against me. My grandfather was a doctor, my father Joseph Goldschmidt, a very successful lawyer. My mother, Cecilia, was intelligent, kind, and excessively solicitous, a saint. Why is it that you need a license to run an ice cream stand or a workshop a license for anything at all, 
regardless of how small it might be, but no license for producing children. Everything would be fine if only parents let us be. A child is a complete human being. And we weigh it down with burdens of tomorrow's responsibilities without giving it today's human rights. In terms of intellect, children are our equals at the very least. They simply lack experience. And in terms of emotions, they're far superior to us because they have had no time to develop any inhibitions or prejudices. I was still a youngster in 1905 during the first revolutionary movements against the Tsar, the first stray gunshots. I like vodka. I always have. The one thing I never had time for was women. They're too demanding. I was involved with one once, and that was more than enough for me. There isn't a healthy spot in my body. Adhesions, lesions, hernias, aches. On top of all that, they've decided that I have a weakened cardiac muscle. So they're afraid of operating on the hernia. My heart might not be able to take the strain. Even though it's capable of taking the strain of the care and suffering of 200 children. I don't care. This profound indolence, a negation of my feelings, a total Jewish resignation. And falling apart and creaking at the joints, disintegrating. But alive. Very much so. I can still pack quite a blow, I assure you. If anyone gets in my way can testify to that. I was part of a consulting team of doctors at a rich Jewish man's house once. The foremost specialists of the day huddled around his child who had a slight sniffle, shaking their heads, <coughs> debating. And uh, what, uh, my dear esteemed colleague, is your diagnosis, they asked me. A little rich Jewish kid's cold, I said. <laughs> I treated the Polish poor for nothing, but I charged the Jewish poor 20 kopecks. Because it says in the Talmud that a doctor who doesn't get paid doesn't do any good. I made it up for it by charging the rich double. When I came back after the war in 1918, I was worried about what I might find at the orphanage. But it was in perfect order. Certainly no worse than if I'd been there, possibly even better. <laughs> Stefa had managed everything on her very own. And during the typhoid ep epidemic, she, she used to carry the children from the orphanage to the hospital in her arms. In August 1939, the moment I heard about the mobilization, I took my major's uniform out of mothballs 
and volunteered for the army. I was too old, they didn't need me. Chaos started soon after that. I stayed in Warsaw with my children. I spoke on the radio about small acts of heroism, about how the children ought to behave in particularly dangerous situations. When Warsaw was besieged, I used to rush over to the town center where bombs were falling and artery shells were exploding just, just to find some food. I kept coming across lost, terrified, wounded children. And I would carry them to the first aid stations and the shelter. But the horror and the suffering in the ghetto was much worse. I used to ask, beg, and shout. Once when someone stole a carload of potatoes during our move to the ghetto, I went to the Gestapo and asked for our property. And at first the German functionaries couldn't understand why a Polish officer was asking for some Jewish potatoes. Why does this concern you? I'm a doctor. Fine, go and treat Polish children. You're not a Jew, but I am. Then why are you walking around without your armband? Ah. I was taken to Bagat prison, beaten, and asked to reveal my co-conspirators in this brazen demonstration. Before my sentence could be handed down, friends of the orphanage collected 3,000 zlotys and bought my freedom. Was it worth it? The children in the ghetto must have as normal a life as possible. They must have respect for each other and they must believe that they are respected too. Last Christmas, a few generous Poles I only know their underground names, organized a Christmas party for us. They were disguised as garbage men. They smuggled in a whole carload of presents under a pile of rubbish. The Count, his underground name, entered last carrying a Christmas tree. The scent of the forest was everywhere. And they sang the Christmas carol Peace to men of goodwill. Bokui lujom dobrivoli. The children were speechless. We were all crying. I witnessed a scene where a man was made to stand on an upended barrel. He was small, he was old, and he had a long beard. And two German officers, big, well built young men, were cutting the old Jew's beard off with a pair of ordinary nail scissors. It looked funny. The Germans were laughing their heads off. The crowd was echoing the laughter. So what? What's horrible about that? Nothing at all. Except that you can put a Jew up on a barrel with impunity and that people would simply laugh. And this is what Yulek wrote. The widow is sitting at home and crying. She is hoping that perhaps her elder son will smuggle some food through. The widow, the widow, widow, widow doesn't know that a German policeman just killed her son. These ghetto children, the smugglers, are the saviors of the whole ghetto. When a German soldier turns his back, they run across to the other side of the wall. They bring back a few potatoes, some carrots, some bread. And if the German sentries don't shake those their treasures out of their rags that they're wearing, that is, or kill them. These children are prolonging the lives of half a million people living in the ghetto. 
If they ever build a monument to honor the dead, they'll have to build one to the children and then carve out the words to the unknown child smuggler. Oh, it's so quiet today. Blessed be the peace, the silence of the night. Last night, they shot only seven Jews. How much longer will this quiet last? They've already deported all the prisoners, all the old people. Now they started picking up people at random. The Jewish police are helping them make up the quotas. A little Jewish girl once asked what she wanted to, what she wanted to be. I'd like to be a dog because the Germans like dogs and I wouldn't have to be afraid that they'd kill me. The most terrible thing is going to your death passively. It's so much easier to die with a gun in your hand. Being born and living, that's a hard thing. It's so much easier to die. I'd like to die in full possession of my senses, fully conscious. Shall I or shall I not get up? I haven't had a bath for quite a time. Stefania! Don't forget, the children have to be weighed today. Stefania, get the children dressed in their very best clothes. Tell them to line up in the hall in fours. And take the orphanage banner, the green banner. We are going on a trip. Those witness the march. So Korchak holding two young children by the hand at the head of an orderly procession of 192 children, Stefa and the staff. All were taken to immediate extermination in the gas chambers. <coughs> the mountains of putrefying corpses were eventually cremate, the ashes scattered in long trenches and covered with earth in which evergreen trees were planted. 17,000 stones brought in from the Polish quarries represent villages, towns, and countries of the one million men, women, and children who died there. Only one rock is engraved. Janusz Korczak, Henrik Goldschmidt, Igeci. <laughs> 